Puberty is a developmental stage of an adolescent that marks a biological coming of age, and this is outlined by typical maturation of some obvious and not so obvious secondary sexual characteristics. Some examples include growth of pubic hair and body hair, acne, enlargement of the genitalia, breast development, widening of the shoulders in boys and the hips in girls, sudden and noticeable growth spurts, muscular atrophy, while there are also sexual reproductive changes including menarche, menses in girls and sperm production and ejaculatory potential in boys. With mentioning is that the onset of puberty lends itself into the body's biological break or resistance switches that regulates many key players that are otherwise present in the background from the infantile to juvenile and finally pubertal and postpubertal stages of human development and aging. Before we go any further, let's discuss what we already know of, starting with the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the hypothalamic pituitary gnadal axis, also known as the HPG axis. The hypothalamus, which is a crucial tissue for releasing hormones, regulating homeostasis, and orchestrating the actions of the pituitary gland, is a small tissue located at the base of the brain. Studies in the past have brought attention to the neurons of the arcuate nucleus located in the mediobasal hypothalamus, which is noted to be responsible for pulse generation. This discovery was made following experiments that induced lesions in the neuronal tissue of the female rhesus monkeys, which had disrupted gonadotropin secretion of FSH and LH. The generated pulse involves a cyclic release of hormones GnRH, also known as gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is directed towards the pituitary gland. Additionally, the result of those lesions had induced a hypogonadotropic state in those monkeys, as well as subsequent research in hypogonadotropic children had translated to detrimental effects to normal development, growth, and can induce delayed or absent pubertal conformation. This finding is telling of the role of the hypothalamus, specifically how a disruption in the HPG axis can understimulate downstream tissues like the gonads, which are the testes in males and ovaries in females. The impeding release of the sex steroid hormones, like testosterone and estrogen, are crucial for the transition into the pubertal state and for development of secondary sexual characteristics. What is the precursory action that triggers the GnRH pulse generation for gonadal stimulation? The arcuate nucleus is also important for another reason. It is one of two places that expresses the KISS1 gene, which encodes for KISS peptin, a peptide hormone used for signaling and initiating the GnRH pulsatility. The role of KISS peptin needs further scientific research, but research in monkeys suggests that GnRH release is partly determined by KISS peptin biosignaling. Furthermore, Terawasa's laboratory in 2012 supports the significance behind the role of kispeptin using microdialysis which has shown that during juvenile development, the release of kispeptin occurs in low amplitudes, whereas in pubertal animals, there is much higher amplitude and frequency of the release in kispeptin, and in parallel, the GnRH pulsatility also ramps up. The fact that kispeptin is an upstream hormone that stimulates the hypothalamus may support its role in GnRH pulse generation. The scientific literature posits that for primate species such as ourselves, it is the activation of the GnRH pulsatility that is responsible for pubertal timing. But what does this mean? How is it triggered? And what does it mean by reactivation? The terminology inherently means that it has to follow a period of connaissance, but it also is suggestive of an earlier stage of activation for most. I emphasize humans and primates over other mammals like rodents due to the discrepancies found in research. Unlike in humans and closely related primates, rodents, for example, do not have a reactivation switch. They have a singular activating event at the onset of puberty, and this distinction is hypothesized to be explained through evolutionary necessity. Humans have larger brains and a more complex neocortical structure, which can benefit from connaissance experienced through the juvenile stage, as opposed to rodents, which benefit from an expedited maturation out of the need to reproduce quickly prior to falling prey. In humans and research conducted on rhesus monkeys, a key player behind pubertal timing has been the reactivation of GnRH pulsatility at the termination of the juvenile stage of life. The Biological Reactivation and Break Switch Model 
In those studies that have detected and monitored GnRH pulse generation in children and rhesus monkeys, have come to the consensus that leading up to puberty, there are two other life stages. Infancy, which includes fetal and neonatal periods of life, followed by the juvenile stage, which is the transient period right before the onset of puberty. The reactivation switch occurs during the juvenile pubertal transition, when GnRH pulse activity increases from less than one pulse for every seven hours to approximately four pulses for every seven hours, and this is achieved over a period of six weeks. This is the juvenile pubertal transition or the reactivation switch. Prior to this, the first switch occurs during the infantile to juvenile stage, when the GnRH pulse activity is inhibited or restrained, and this is the break switch. Although GnRH pulse generation during infancy is akin to pubertal and adult levels, where they differ is that GnRH activity at infancy is determined more so by cognitive development rather than sexual development, since now the ovulation or spermatogenesis is initiated at such a young age. This is further supported by monitoring preterm babies, who actually had higher GnRH levels in term babies, likely to compensate for the elevated demands for cognitive development. Therefore, it is plausible that once cognitive development has achieved an acceptable level of maturation, the need for GnRH pulsatility and its corresponding effects are no longer required, and the infancy to juvenile transition can begin with a break switch. The somatometer, which is the alleged biological measurement tool that works in tandem with the aforementioned break mechanism, and ultimately determining GnRH pulsatility and the resulting LH and FSA secretions that affect the gonads. It is possible that the somatometer may in fact be a biological organ or a tissue capable of detecting physiological changes, or it might work in conjunction with other neuronal and endocrine tissues to detect these variances. On the other hand, it may be an age-dependent result of the body's physiological response to factors achieving a certain maturation, such as adiposity, leptin concentration, bone development, and the rising levels of gonadal hormones LH during sleep. Nonetheless, these changes have the potential to setting off a casket of hormones and their effects that kickstart the onset of puberty. Puberty is a strong age-dependent mechanism. In infancy, as previously mentioned, the release of GnRH and the gonadotropin hormones are dependent on the degree of cognitive development, as seen with elevated levels of GnRH pulsatility in preterm infants as opposed to term babies. Although the somatometer is not directly involved, the effect is the same and the brakes are let off the arcuate nucleus, starting with hypothalamic stimulation of GnRH, FSH, and L8 secretion, and finally the stimulation of the gonads. Detection of androgens like testosterone and estrogen are present, although without gametogenesis or the onset of puberty. At the juvenile stage, the neurobiological breaks are applied onto the arcuate nucleus as per the discretion of the somatometer, represented by the black box. As evidenced by the underwhelming levels of hypothalamic stimulation and subsequent hypergonadotropic levels of FSH and LH. No longer is cognitive development a factor, Therefore, the somatometer takes over the and determines the onset of puberty based on an age-dependent bodily changes. These include the proposed triggers that will be discussed next. Finally, the pubertal stage is when the somatometer has its physiological criteria satisfied, the gonads are matured, and the neurological breaks in the arcuate nucleus is released to initiate the onset of puberty, including the casket of hormones and associated physiological changes, as well as gametogenesis. What factors are measured by the somatometer and ultimately responsible for reactivating the switch of the juvenile pubertal transition? The idea of the somatometer dates back to the works and ideas of Frisch in 1940. She proposed that in girls, a critical mass of fat to lean ratio rather than a critical age had to be obtained for menarche to occur. With the discovery of the adipose tissue hormone leptin in 1994, the ideas of Frisch were rekindled. Animal models with leptin deficiency displayed lower KISS-1 mRNA expression, especially in an arcuate nucleus, and a decreased number of KISS-peptin neurons. 
Kispeptin, as previously mentioned, plays a pivotal role in hypothalamic stimulation of the HPG axis, and consequently, inadequate levels could certainly affect pubertal onset. Furthermore, administration of exogenous leptin in sheep showed recovery from the hypogonadotropic state. From a physiological perspective, puberty is an energy-intensive process, and a lack of energy storage or adipose tissue in animal models from rats to sheep and some anecdotal human trials suggest that leptin does play a role, although not conclusively since more of the trials were not conducted specifically on pubertal models or human subjects. Although this pattern of synchrony was not observed among boys with normal pubertal maturation, lending to the notion that there might be other factors intrinsic to those abnormal conditions that delay or expedite puberty. In addition, multiple conditions that delay skeletal growth, such as malnourishment, systemic diseases, constitutional delay, and growth hormone deficiencies have also delayed puberty, whereas pathologies that expedite skeletal growth, such as exposure to steroids, also expedite pubertal timing. The idea that the maturation of the skeleton may dictate pubertal timing is a reasonable hypothesis. Previous studies have observed a strong correlation between bone age and pubertal onset in boys with abnormal maturation. These include boys with congenital adrenal hyperplasia or abnormal adrenal glands, and in boys with familial male precocious puberty. Individuals with the greatest skeletal development began puberty earlier. In contrast to boys with idiopathic short stature, who also had the highest degree of skeletal delay, began puberty at a later age. In these studies, the degree of skeletal advancement or delay had coincided with the degree of pubertal maturation. Studies that monitor LH and FSA secretion show that these hormones are detectable prior to the visible signs of secondary characteristics of puberty. At first, surges of LH occur predominantly at night, resulting in stimulation of the gonads and elevated steroid hormone levels early in the morning. These then wane throughout the day. With continuing maturation of the HPG axis, which is an age-dependent process, increased GnRH and subsequent LH and FSH release occurs throughout the day and the waking hours as well. The rising levels of these hormones promote the development of secondary characteristics and changes in the body composition noted at puberty. In conclusion, the onset of puberty is determined by any of the following potential triggers detected with the somatometer, which ultimately releases the brakes on the arcuate nucleus, leading to an increase in kispeptin synthesis and subsequently GnRH pulsatility, followed by FSH and LH release. Finally, stimulation of the gonads and synthesis of testosterone, estrogen, and other androgens can further impose typical secondary sexual characteristics expected at puberty. None of the aforementioned triggers can single-handedly trigger the onset of puberty, but rather, a synergistic effect of those mentioned and others may play a role in initiating pubertal onset in children. Further research is still required for causal explanations. We understand that puberty is typically expected in a child's developmental trajectory, so why do the mechanisms behind its onset matter? This is because, as with any other physiological process, there are variances among the population, and unfortunately there are drawbacks in certain instances. For example, precocious and delayed puberty. Without research into the mechanism that initiates pubertal timing, there would be insufficient scientific literature on why puberty can occur earlier in some individuals and much later in others. This is especially troubling among children that are diagnosed with Kalman syndrome, which is delayed or absent puberty. A diagnosis is half the story. The treatment of this pathology and the means to identify the biological culprit responsible for its onset starts by understanding the underlying mechanisms that constitute the normal state of any condition. From there, concerns around malnutrition, stress, systemic diseases and hormonal imbalances such as hypogonadotropism, growth hormone deficiencies and others can be addressed in a holistic and effective manner. Limitation in research. The biggest limitation we have around this topic is that most studies rely on rodent and sheep test subjects, which may serve as a satisfactory comparison to humans, 
but the complexities around the physiology of puberty in humans and primates are more or less unique to us in some respects. For example, experiments in rodents have found out that they do not have a so-called break or reactivation switch, but rather they have a singular activating event for the onset of puberty. The hypothesis for this distinction is due to the fact that rodents require an expedited maturation process in order to quickly reproduce and spawn a new generation before they are preyed upon. Modern humans do not worry about such urgencies to that extent. We benefit from a drawn-out maturation that is emphasized through the juvenile period of life when reproductive and physiological changes are suspended in a state of quiescence, but simultaneously, this period may serve to carefully develop our complex neuronal tissue and prime our physiology for the impending changes. In addition, research may benefit from looking at the sex-related differences observed in boys and girls. One of these differences is that on average, girls begin puberty around 8 to 13 years of age, and boys start around 9 to 14 years of age. This may suggest that in boys, there is a strong negative feedback to the onset of puberty, as opposed to girls who typically experience puberty earlier. Suffice to say, puberty is a complex, physiological phenomena and that requires further research.